The Israeli-Gaza conflict is intensifying. Israel's Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu is not agreeing to a ceasefire and has vowed to move forward with its plans to wipe out Hamas since the militant group launched its surprise attack on Israel on October 7th. More than 8,000 people have been killed and tens of thousands are left homeless. The World Bank is predicting oil prices could reach uncharted waters this conflict does not come to some resolution soon. Also, you have massive protests taking place all across the world for folks who are saying free Palestine. It's also having a significant impact on the poll numbers of President Joe Biden as many young voters are angry with his support for Israel's Response. Joining me now is counterterrorism expert, author Malcolm Nance. Malcolm, glad to have you uh, on the show. Uh, so first, uh, let, let's start here. Um, it has been very interesting watching all of these responses. Folks were shocked by the Hamas attack. Obviously, Israel was going to respond. But now you have folks who are saying, wait a minute, you move forward with a ground assault all of a sudden, now you're displacing millions of people, 2.2 million in Gaza along, 50% children. Uh, the whole battle, do you allow in uh, water, food, uh, oil, things along those lines? Just your assessment where we are now some uh, 23 days later. You know, I'm glad you've asked me that because I really want to put into, into perspective what a lot of people are responding to is about three weeks old. Uh, in, a, in, a, in a circumstance, uh, a historical circumstance that's well over a century in the development that's 70 years since the um, founding of Israel, which has been occurring nonstop. There's been a, you know, a circular crisis for, you know, for decades at this point. However, let's go to the precipitating event before people say, okay, you're, you're, you know, you're bombing Palestinian children. What happened on 7 October? was unprecedented. I mean, unprecedented in the history of Israel. Yes, they had multiple Arab armies attack them in uh, 1948. They attacked multiple Arab armies in 1956. In 1967, another Arab armies attack. 1973, a surprise attack by Egypt on 6 October 1973. What, what happened on 7 October 19, uh, 2023, which was 50 years plus one day, was a terrorist group, Hamas, which is an international terrorist group. It, it, it carries out acts of terrorism. It is not a resistance organization. It is not freedom fighters. When they attack, they kill only civilians for a political purpose to impact an audience outside of the immediate victims. Definition of terrorism. They attacked Israel across the borders and went and hunted every man, woman, and child on the other side of that border. They did not bypass villages to go engage the police. They did not bypass towns to go engage the army in a straight battle. They carried out an ISIS-like act of terrorism. And over a day, they slaughtered by hand, one by one, 1,400 individual people, literally used all their ammunition to fight the army, to execute every civilian across that border. Now, on the other hand, it did include some people you wouldn't have imagined. Uh, Afri Sub-Saharan African taxi drivers, uh, Thai guest workers, uh, people, nurses from the Philippines and India. They killed everyone. And the purpose of their operation was to launch and kill everyone. Then bring 200 or more hostages back to Gaza and hope that the Israelis would go insane come across that border in a blitz, and they would have an apocalyptic battle in the middle of 2.2 million Palestinians and hope that they would gain the support of all the Arab world and terrorist groups around the world and, that, and to show that Israel was now <coughs> fighting in the middle. Israel right now is, is listening to U.S. advice. They are not running into this battle. I call it Pac-Man at molasses speed, which is what we would have advised them to do when we fought battles against ISIS and Al Qaeda terrorists in Iraq. You go slowly, you bite off sectors, you isolate the enemy, 
and you try to get the civilian population to displace. When we attacked Fallujah, 90% of the population of that city was gone, we had moved, had seen the fighting was coming. Palestinians, the Hamas, aren't doing that. The Palestinian population is trapped with Hamas in, this, uh, in the Gaza Strip, but the Israelis are going to have to carry out this operation against ISIS, uh, sorry, Hamas anyway in order to eliminate them off the face of the earth, technically. And that's where we are. So uh, this is from, this is from uh, Human Rights Watch, uh, mm -hmm. uh, Malcolm, uh, and they put this out on August 28th. Um, more than a month before. We talked about uh, the number of Palestinian children who had been killed in uh, the West Bank. They said last year, 2022, was the deadliest year for Palestinian children uh, in the West mm -hmm. Bank uh, in more than 15 years. Well, I, I bring that up because as we examine, as we examine this, this, this entire deal, you talk about the number of Israelis uh, who were killed uh, on October 7th, uh, and we've also seen Palestinians killed. And, and, and so really where the struggle is now, I mean, I'm looking at what's, I'm looking at these college campuses, I'm looking at what's happening in these cities, uh, I'm looking at right. these massive marches uh, as well, um, and you, you, you're, the number of people who literally are saying, uh, highly critical uh, of Israel's action as well, is that killing begets killing, begets more killing, begets more killing, and therefore there is really no uh, end to this. Uh, President, yeah. go ahead. I hear this argument all the time. I mean, I worked in this region for 40 years. My first 10 years were spent working the Hezbollah, Israel, Palestine, Lebanon, uh, com, you know, terror environment. Uh, in fact, trying to isolate the location so that we can carry out hostage rescues of over 100 foreigners that were being held by Hezbollah in Lebanon. I mean, if you want to go back on arguments that are historical in nature, Go back to the Roman occupation of Judea in 6 BC. Or, you know, I mean, this region, this part of the world has been involved in cycles of human conflict forever. The, the, you know, the Israelis or the, you know, the Jews have been there since 1250 BC. I mean, there's, you know, there's this historical argument people want to make. I am merely trying to put it into perspective on when on, on October 7th. If that attack had occurred in the United States, and it wasn't artillery hitting a neighborhood and maybe killing three or four people, it was summary execution of every person they found in it, that part of Israel. Summary execution. Took them, zip-tied them, right. lined them, shot them in the head. Very big difference from people who are killed in war, because war has a completely different set of rules. If you violate it, you do it deliberately, that's called a war crime. Terrorism is when you hunt down the equivalent of 50,000 US citizens and execute them one bullet at a time. So the precipitating event was designed by Hamas to do precisely what you see the Israelis are doing. They want this war, they want this battle with their fighters. They set up right. to be in the middle of civilians so civilians would die at the hands of the Israelis because to them, that's martyrdom. So how do you, so, now, so how do you now deal with this? Some 300, uh, go to my iPad, 300 to 500,000 people uh, protesting uh, in uh, London over the weekend. Then of course you had thousands who were marching in Los Angeles, in New York. Uh, and, and so, and, and, and now what you're seeing you're now seeing that this uh, conflict is having uh, a direct impact on the presidential election uh, because sure. if you now look at the poll numbers, folks are pissed off, a, a, a number, especially a number of young voters, at President Joe Biden's um, a response to this. Uh, the State Department early, you know, early on saying no talk of, of a ceasefire, and folks are saying, what are you talking about? And so... That's the conundrum that we are now in in American politics. Well, look, let's go back to England and that march there. England has a, a Muslim population that is astronomical compared to the United States. So seeing 100,000 people march in London in solidarity with the Palestinian people is fine. People marching in Los Angeles, people marching in New York City. I wrote a Substack op-ed just a couple of days ago where I said the problem that we're having with certainly a lot of these young voters and even African-American Black Lives Matter activists, 
they don't quite understand some of the words, terminology, and things they're vote protesting for. This isn't about, I mean, whose babies matter more, right? When Israel goes and bombs Hamas, they are not aiming at the Palestinian people. For people who have never been in war, for people who have never actually had to plan these strikes, who have to knock out 500 kilometers of underground tunnels, to you it looks like indiscriminate bombing. I've had to plan these airstrikes, Bosnia, Libya, Lebanon, Iraq, Syria. We don't hit indiscriminately. The Israelis don't either because, one, it serves no purpose. Two, it does not degrade the terrorist group. Three, it just creates hate and, and mayhem. So, how, so, so Malcolm, so Malcolm, how do, but how, how do you then, though, explain yeah. to those very same people that the conditions under which the Palestinians are living, uh, un, being unable to self-govern, unable to move, um, Jimmy Carter called it apartheid in his book. And so how do you still even deal with that? Because that, that's really where a, a lot of people are. There are simply, they're, they're people who are saying they don't want to see death on either side. They don't want to see Israelis uh, being killed and Palestinians being killed. And then it all comes back to a two-state solution. Is that real? Sure. Can you ever yeah. achieve that? That's politics. And look, you're never going to find anybody. I spent my, I speak Palestinian dialect Arabic, Levantine dialect Arabic. I have been for the two-state solution forever. You know, I've been in, in that region of the world for decades. Uh, but some things you do have to understand. Most of the people that are angry right now couldn't spell Palestine three weeks ago. They weren't angry when, Sadat, when uh, Bashir al-Assad used chemical weapons and mass murdered 500,000 of their own people. There's a fight going on in Sudan right now. 5,000 people have yep. been killed by two factions that have been fighting. Somalia, Libya, Lebanon. Oh, Jesus, Lebanon. I went to the Civil War. They had been massacring each other to the tune of 125,000 people. ISIS literally tried to wipe out all of northern Iraq and Syria and took slaves doing it. What people are showing here is one of two things. One, this is something they could wrap their head around because there's a lot of cameras. Or, to be quite honest, there's a lot of inherent anti-Semitism in this. And maybe they think in solidarity with their Palestinian brothers and sisters who are angry that this position is the right one. But you know what? This is essentially like protesting for al-Qaeda, all right, after 9-11. You have to determine your terminology. And I've seen a lot of these young kids on campus do this. You must exclude Hamas from your discussion. If you say you're for the Palestinian people, God bless them, I love them. Be for the Palestinian people. But then you have to condemn the terrorist group Hamas that is using 2.2 million people for human shields. Hamas is underground, three, four, five, you know, hundred meters underground, and they have left the Palestinian people on the top to take the bombing from the Israelis. That's part of their strategy. Dead baby strategy, we call it. Terrorist groups have used it forever. I don't want to see this fighting, but this isn't a question of whether you can have a ceasefire. When you mass murder every individual, every one, 1,400, one by one, then take 200 hostages, you're going to get what you're getting. It happened to us. It happened with Al-Qaeda. It happened with ISIS, Hamas, knew what they were doing, and they abandoned the Palestinian people above ground to take the Israeli shellings and killings. Even though the Israelis are trying not to kill them, artillery, bombs, rockets, and machine gun fire, if you do not displace out of the battle space, can hurt you and kill you. In many circumstances, Hamas won't let civilians leave. So, you know, unfortunately, this is called war. And people are talking like the Palestinian people weren't beleaguered before three weeks ago. Well, but and, but, 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 but Malcolm, there, there, there are people who are who are activists who were talking. No, 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 follow me here. There were people who were talking about the Palestinian people before three weeks ago. Folks, we're talking to a uh, counterterrorism expert and author Malcolm Nance. You see right here uh, a number of his uh, books uh, you can actually uh, check out uh, right there. Uh, my panel, they have been awaiting to ask you a few questions. I'll start first with Julian Malvo. Dr. Julian Malvo, uh, economist, president, Emerita Bennett College. Julian, go right ahead. 
Brother Malcolm, first of all, let me say how much I appreciate you and your work and your history and your legacy. At the same time, I have to ask you, because implicit in some of what you said has been basically an anti-Palestinian bias. Is it possible to be critical of Israel and still not be a, being accused of being anti-Semitic? This happens to many of us every day. We are critical of the relationship the United States has with Israel, with the unfettered dollars that we've given to Israel. Can we off, basically articulate those criticisms without being called anti-Semitic? Right. Well, first, I'm honored to be speaking to Dr. Julian Malveaux. Uh, you're, you know, another one of my heroes. Uh, but let me answer your question quite plainly. I am a counterterrorism and intelligence expert. My job is simple. All right. We identify threats which meet the threshold of terrorism. We categorize those threats. We factor them in as to what culture, location, geography, all of those other things. And then we work back on the history. Hamas, by every definition, every definition is a terrorist group. What they carried out on October 7th, without any question, was the summary execution one by one of 1,400 people. That is where I draw the line on everything, okay? Anti-Palestinian, I've worked with the Palestinians for decades. I love the Palestinian people. I think that what happens in Israel is quite unfair. I am not for the, you know, the, uh, you know, the settlement of the West Bank. I'm a big follower of the two-state solution. I think that given the right circumstances, time, maybe even now at the end of this crisis, maybe the time for the Palestinian people to have true self-determination. Voting for Hamas 17 years ago and then Hamas never running another opportunity for them to express leadership or for them to express who they want to be in, and now it's 58% that prefer to have the Palestinian Authority in, in charge. Hamas wiped them out in 2000, you know, in the, in the battles of 2005 to 2007, literally, literally wiped out the Palestinian Authority police. Uh, it is a terrorist group that is now running, all right, a, 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 a population of 2.2 million people, and they do not spend their money on those people. They spent all of the piping that was supposed to be for underground water features to build over 10,000 rockets. They spent all of the concrete money to rebuild structures on a, you know, a, a, uh, a hundreds of kilometer multi-layered tunnel system, which we're now finding out uh, is a lot more extensive than even we thought. Palest uh, the, the Palestinians in Gaza, the Gazans, could have all of that aid money used for themselves. We saw a good example of it on the massacre. They caught the pickup trucks that were being used, were supposed to be used for the municipality. They, the first aid kits on their terrorist groups were all donated by UNICEF for the population. This isn't about being anti-Palestinian. This isn't about being pro-Israel. This is about identifying a threat which, which traps as hostages the entire 2.2 million Palestinians. Should we be sympathetic to the innocent people? Yes, we should. But we should also understand that Hamas has now reached the level of ISIS, and they are going to have to, well, essentially be treated exactly like ISIS, which is the only way you're going to be able to uh, get rid of the people who carried out that massive onslaught and break this cycle is to free the Palestinian people, but eliminate the people that carried out the terrorism. Uh, let, me, let me also remind you that uh, the Bush administration was told uh, by the PLO not to keep pressing for that election in Gaza. They ignored the PLO, and we see what has happened. There was the election. They said, they said Hamas was going to win, and that's what happened, and there's not been an election in Gaza since. Former you're, you're having, I make a quick point on that. Because the Israelis, and here's where I criticize the Israelis, were so damn focused on killing Yasser Arafat and getting rid of their old nemesis, the Palestinian Liberation Organization, which became the Palestinian Authority, that they didn't, un they, uh, either they understood or they just didn't comprehend, they were electing an, a radical terrorist group. Well, 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 well we, now have, we now have Israelis who have been critical of Netanyahu uh, for basically cutting off the PLO and, in, in a sense, encouraging 
money going to Hamas in order to split those two apart. And th this is now what we're left with. So to your point, what, what they did then is what Netanyahu, frankly, has continued up till this day. Roland, Malcolm didn't answer my question about whether it was possible to be critical of Israel and still not be described as anti-Semitic. I think this is really important for some of the young people who are protesting and for many others. Malcolm? Sure, I get it. Not a, moment, not, a, not a minute ago, I was critical of Israel without being anti-Semitic. This is politics. This isn't religion. But what we're finding uh, in some of the protests, and again, I wrote this substack because I got sent some horrific stuff by African Americans, uh, you know, I, I can tell when Palestinian Americans or Arab Americans or others, you know, people from Southwest Asia write to me in Arabic or, or you know, uh, but, you know, we have some people here who are now essentially letting their freak flags fly. fly. They are coming out and revealing an inner anti-Semitism, which, you know, to be quite honest, is, is not normal for this clash between African Americans and, uh, and Jews. And they're making it that. Not Israelis, not Netanyahu. No one is ever going to support Netanyahu after this, this massacre. He was a criminal, uh, essentially about to lose power, worked with the right wing, and he is responsible for a lot of this. But the terrorist attack, he is not responsible for, other than the fact that he moved three brigades off that border in order to suppress, uh, you know, assist settlers in the West Bank. Things will have to change here. You can criticize Israel, but you can and not be considered anti-Semitic. But if you support Hamas openly, which I have seen, now you are supporting a terrorist group, and that is where you're probably going to have a lot of trouble. Rodina Shannon, go ahead. Well, first, I want to say, um, you know, I take offense to you saying that anybody who sort of doesn't see the conflict the way that you see it, they are people who just learned how to spell Palestine last week. It's not true. Many folks have been informed about this ongoing conflict and what has happened and looking much further than October 7th and going back decades. I think that that is represented by the fact that you do have people across the, the world who are standing in support of Palestinians and also by the fact that you have what is a growing and significant Jewish voice of, you know, that is building and growing that are saying, you know, not in our name, we want a ceasefire um, and have consistently stood for Palestinian rights. So I'm going to ask you more of a political question since you sort of walked into what type of people you feel um, do not share your same viewpoint. And so the political question is, what would you say to people who are looking at this and are thinking about the fact that here in America, they are paying tax dollars. As black folks, we are constantly being told that we can't have reparations because that's too expensive. We are constantly being told as Americans all together that we can't do any sort of broad health care because that's too expensive. We're told we can't have child care, um, universal child care support, because that's too expensive. Everything is too expensive, but what is never too expensive is funding wars that are going on outside of the country. What would you say to people who feel like that? Because many people, they do know how to read, they have studied history, and they just have a different view than you. Yeah, well, my view comes from the, the counterterrorism perspective as the person that had to deal with these people for, for and I, when I say people, I'm talking terrorists, all right? I am not talking the people of Palestine. And the only way that you generally get rid of terrorist groups is you have to cope, you have to have the population lose their support, to have the shackles lifted off of them from groups like ISIS and Al Qaeda and some the Shabaab in Somalia. And that's the only way that they can start moving forward with their lives. So that's the perspective that I come from. It is not an anti-Semitic perspective. It is not an anti-Arab perspective. I've worked with both on both sides. Uh, you know, and certainly uh, every country that surrounds them uh, from a military and intelligence perspective. I understand it. And believe me, a lot of people are new to this. For those who aren't, bravo, help educate the people who have just come into this. And, uh, you know, and this is no slam to the people who are <coughs> emotional about this, because it is an emotional issue. I was just in Dubai and Qatar on the days after the attack. At the same time, Secretary Blinken and Secretary of Defense Austin were there. And the Gulf states, even though for all of their rhetoric, are really tired of the terrorism and having to fund uh, you know, uh, these international groups. But here for people who are here on this side, who see money going overseas, the kind of money we're talking about is one fraction, one fraction of a percent 
here in the United States. Now, Israel every year got $3.5 billion in defense support. As a balance for the treaty that they had with Egypt, with Anwar Sadat and Menachem Begin, we give Egypt $3.5 billion in defense support so that they can combat their current ISIS problem that's occurring in the Sinai. So what do you say? We, why shouldn't we keep that money at home? We have more than enough money to walk and chew gum at the same time. Now, you're talking to a person who fought in Ukraine for a year with the International Legion. I hear this same argument about Ukraine, uh, even though we're actually saving money by giving these uh, archaic uh, weapon systems that would have to be disposed of and paid for through breakers and, and people getting rid of ammunition the same way. You are not, as a person who is in, let's say, Detroit, going to receive 155 millimeter artillery shells that the United States already pre-positioned in Israel for a broader Middle East war. We are giving them those stocks. We are not giving the Israeli government money to expand their economy. We are not giving the Israeli money, uh, government money to buy new villas. We are giving them war stocks that the United States paid for decades ago, which we store in Israel in order for them to start to carry out the operation that they may need. Not to mention, it's not just Hamas. Israel is preparing because they may have a multi-front war with terrorists in Lebanon, Hezbollah, a group that I worked against for decades, all right, uh, that are backed directly by Iran, uh, Shia Muslim uh, militias that operate out of Syria that attack across the Golan Heights. You may have a three-front war. And not to mention Iran, by extension, which had its uh, subordinates in Yemen fire missiles towards Israel. This can get a lot worse. And if you want to talk about American money going somewhere, just imagine this becoming a regional war uh, between Iran, Syria, Le uh, parts of Lebanon, Hezbollah in Lebanon, and then the offensive that they're doing against Hamas. It's better that this not get out of control and that the United States support it with the resources which are already there. I'm Congo Dominga, professorial lecturer, School of International Service, American University. Yes, uh, Mr. Nance, I have a great deal of respect uh, for your work and, and really have just an appreciation of not just your service, but your family's history of service. I, I think, you know, being on, on a campus, I see much of the difference between those who may, you know, support Hamas, but much of what I'm seeing, and even in colleges I'm speaking at across the country, it, uh, they are people who are able to differentiate between a terrorist organization and the people on the ground. My, my question for you is, I'm of the philosophy that you can't bomb an idea away. I'm of the philosophy that for every one innocent killed, you, you can create 10 more terrorists. And I just don't see how this leadership under Netanyahu, you described him as relates to the people he surrounded himself with. I don't see how this actually ends Hamas. In my opinion, I feel like this is something that is going to create more members of Hamas just by these violent attacks alone. You know this region better than most, and you know what people have nothing to turn to may turn to the most militant wing, like you said, who's also been empowered by Netanyahu in some ways, but that's just going to continue the idea of Hamas. And I just don't see how this current strategy is going to lead to the ending of Hamas. Well, see, this is where I, I agree with you. I've written three books, and I'll, including a New York Times bestseller on Al Qaeda and ISIS ideology and how they fight. Um, you know, you cannot shoot an idea out of, if you put a bullet through the brain of a person. But this isn't an ideology. What you're seeing here is a transformation of Hamas's technique. Uh, yes, their I, their ideology is is they are Palestinian nationalists. They seek the return of their homeland. And when they say their homeland, they don't mean Gaza and the West Bank. They mean every inch of geographic Israel as it was decided by the, you know, when it was carved out of Transjordan by the British. They're talking, when they make that motto, and this is where university students need to be a little careful. When they say from the river to the sea, they're talking about the elimination of all Judaism and Zionism, whatever you want to call it, all people. Uh, you know, including, uh, as, as we saw on the October 7th attack, they wiped out an entire Muslim Bedouin tribe because they said, you were on the other side of the fence, you're no better than Jews. Uh, that's what they mean, the elimination of the state of Israel. Now, you and I both know that that's just rhetoric that is never going to happen, 
All right, Israel is a nuclear power. Uh, they have a military force that is that has overmatch on all armies around them: Jordanian, Egyptian, Syrian, Lebanese, Saudi. It doesn't matter what you throw at them. If they go to full mobilization, they will defeat you. But in terms of Hamas and Gaza, the Israelis have made it clear that they are going to eat their way through Gaza City, because that's where the heart of Hamas is forces are. Now, there are three more sectors of the Strip south of that that they will probably have to deal with as well. But for the men who planned, uh, mobilized, and crossed that border in essentially a, a an invasion with the intent to kill every living Jew on the other side of the border, they did a pretty good job of it. Um, the Israelis are not going to be adopting a posture in which they will be allowed to exist. So they are taking a look at how we did the Battle of Fallujah in 2004, which is what our Secretary of Defense sent over advisors to say, do not run into Gaza. It's an ambush that Hamas set up for Israel. The entire 7 October attack was designed for you, all of you, to see precisely what you're seeing and to garner support Middle East wide with protests. Uh, you know, I have an article coming out called about how Hamas needs those dead babies. They have pandered this about forever. And now they've got dead Israeli babies. There is blood up on both sides. But you can wipe out a terrorist group for this generation. But here's another thing I caution, I caution all of my Israeli uh, followers of. There will need to be a grand deal at the end of this. Or you will go into Hamas 2.0, 3.0, with more enemies possibly coming from Lebanon, Syria, a massive explosion of Middle East terrorism. I predict we're going to see pro-Hamas terrorism here in the United States. And then you're really going to see American, popular, uh, American support change. We're going to go right back to 2001, the way people will start behaving. So something will have to change the status quo of Netanyahu, and now his unity government, he's not the only person making decisions, is going to have to start thinking about in the two-state solution seriously. And I've had Israelis all week tell me to my face that will never happen now that these bodies have been stacked up in Israel. Well, it will have to happen, because it's the only way to break this cycle uh, to empower the Palestinians themselves and to rid Gaza of Hamas. But mark my words, we did it to ISIS. You're going to see in northern Gaza City, Hamas as a military force will cease to exist. Malcolm Nets, we appreciate it. Thank you. And it's going to definitely going to be uh, one thing to watch because uh, there is carnage uh, happening all there. Israelis and Palestinians uh, dying left and right. Uh, and that's what's most unfortunate. Death is death. You don't come back from that. We appreciate it. Thanks a lot.